You will own nothing and be happy. This infamous prediction from the World Economic Forum is recognized by almost everyone these days, yet there are few who believe it could ever come to pass. Well, what if I told you that our ownership of things is quickly disappearing and that many of us are unknowingly embracing this new normal? Today, I'm going to tell you about a disturbing trend that's finding its way into every corner of the economy, where this trend came from, and why cryptocurrency could be the only defense. I know it's annoying, but I must give you a quick disclaimer before we get going. Financial advice is not something I give. This channel is purely about knowing. So please contact a financial advisor if your portfolio isn't growing. Now, if this is the first time we hang out, my name is Guy and my mission is to create high quality content that will make you doubt. If this is the kind of content you can't do without, subscribing to the channel and pinging that notification bell is a good shout. Okay, that's all you need to know about this crypto scout. Let's see why you'll soon own nothing and why that's nothing to be happy about. How often do you upgrade or change your phone? Statistically speaking, your answer will be somewhere in the range of two to three years. This is consistent with the lifespan of the average phone battery, which tends to give out after a couple of years of use, even if you're taking care of your phone's battery, namely not letting it drop below 20% or go above 90%, the more you know. Now, in theory, the solution is simple. Just install a new battery when the current one gives out and enjoy your phone for another two to three years until you need to replace the battery again, and so on and so on. In practice, however, opening your phone and switching the battery is generally not easy to do and can damage the phone. This assumes you can even get your hands on a replacement battery to begin with, which isn't guaranteed. In the case of newer iPhone models, the phone will actually detect when you've replaced the battery and will give you all manner of warning messages which push you to go to the Apple Store for an extensive repair that could cost as much as a brand new phone. Now, critics of this setup have accurately observed that the inability to independently open, modify, or repair a device that you own means that you don't actually own it, because ownership literally means the ability to do all of the above and more. These and other issues have given rise to a global movement called Right to Repair, which has managed to pressure Apple and other tech giants into making repairs more accessible albeit to a limited degree due to the lobbying power these corporations wield. The right to repair also doesn't always fix the underlying ownership issue, and this is something that's been pointed out on many occasions by Louis Rossman, a popular YouTuber and computer repair shop owner who has gone head-to-head -head with anti-repair corporate lobbyists. Now, this video was partially inspired by Louis's content, and I strongly suggest checking out his channel if you're interested in the dystopian direction that technology seems to be heading and want to know how some folks are fighting back on the policy front. I'll leave a link to his channel in the description. Now, as to why the right to repair doesn't always fix the underlying ownership issue, look no further than the phenomenon of manufacturers slowing down phones to force you to buy a new one. Any Android users in the crowd will know that Samsung was fined for doing exactly that in 2018. As is often the case with big tech companies, Samsung was issued a fine that amounted to a slap on the wrist compared to the profits it probably made from artificially slowing down phones, something which the company is allegedly still doing to this day. This level of control negates any aspect of ownership, and let's just hope Solana doesn't do this to its upcoming crypto phones. More about that in the description. Anyway, I digress. Now, it's not just phones either. The practice of forcing people to upgrade through some nefarious means has found its way into everything from household appliances to hospital equipment. What's crazy is that this practice has been around for almost a hundred years, and it even has a name, planned obsolescence. Although planned obsolescence has its origins in the early American bicycle and automobile industries, the term was coined by an American real estate broker named Bernard London in a paper titled, quote, Ending the Depression Through Planned Obsolescence, which he published in 1932. In the paper, Bernard said that the Great Depression made no sense because, quote, 
Factories, warehouses and fields are still intact and are ready to produce in unlimited quantities, but the urge to go ahead has been paralyzed by a decline in buying power and, by extension, a decline in demand. Given this situation, Bernard proposed the following solution. Quote, I would have the government assign a lease of life to shoes and homes and machines, to all products of manufacture, mining and agriculture, when they are first created, and they would be sold and used within the term of their existence definitely known by the consumer. After the allotted time had expired, these things would be legally dead and would be controlled by the duly appointed governmental agency and destroyed if there is widespread unemployment. In other words, everything produced in the economy would be artificially made obsolete by the government at a certain date to cause the population to consume more so that the economy recovers while simultaneously providing ample employment, further fostering economic growth. Now, if you watched our video about how to prepare for the crypto bear market, you'll know that it was the Second World War that arguably ended the Great Depression and Bernard's problematic idea of planned obsolescence never really caught on as a result. This is primarily because the post-war period was one of incredible prosperity, particularly for the United States, as it managed to reap much of the rewards of victory while incurring little in the way of losses compared with its allies. The US dollar had also just become the world's reserve currency. More importantly, the populations of countries like the United States and Canada exploded after the Second World War, creating the army of well-off old folks many of us now refer to as boomers. This is important because the rapid increase in population meant there was a rapid increase in consumption, and that meant that there was no need for planned obsolescence business practices. Companies could comfortably sell high-quality hardware that would last for decades because they knew there would always be another wave of buyers coming next year as more baby boomers became adult boomers. This seems to have been the case until the 1970s, when it became clear that baby boomers weren't having nearly the same number of children as their forebears. It appears that many Western countries tried to fill this future demographic gap by opening their doors to immigration, and this seems to have worked for a while. By the early 2000s, however, it became clear that immigration alone wasn't enough to fill the future demographic gap, which of course continued to grow as companies needed ever more future consumption to continue their future expansion. All the while, native birth rates continued to decline. This seems to be the period when Bernard's idea of planned obsolescence started to become a reality. Companies were effectively forced into selling low-quality products that would require a repurchase every few years to continue consumption trends in the absence of a growing population. Now, I know what you're thinking. Guy, this is all very interesting, but what does this have to do with me owning nothing and being happy? Well, I'm glad you asked, hypothetical impatient viewer. Any iOS users in the crowd might recall that Bloomberg reported that Apple will be rolling out a subscription service for iPhones later this year or early next year. To be clear, this upcoming subscription service is not at all like Apple's existing subscription services. That's because it applies to hardware, not software. The subscription service will be for the physical phone itself. As Louis Rossman pointed out in his video reaction to the news, a service is when someone or something does something for you. A phone is not a service, it is a product, and it should be entirely yours from the moment you purchase it. Louis also highlighted the fact that many Wall Street investors are pushing for publicly traded companies to adopt this so-called hardware-as-a-service business model because it will make them trade at higher valuations regardless of their actual earnings, something that's mentioned in the Bloomberg article. Trading at higher valuations regardless of actual earnings sounds eerily similar to the ESG investment trend, which effectively consists of asset managers moving their money into companies that comply with their ever-changing criteria, causing their stocks to pump even though no actual profits are being made. While I couldn't find any concrete evidence that ESG investors are behind this accelerating trend towards hardware as a service in various sectors, it wouldn't be surprising given that the trend is inherently ESG friendly. Hardware as a service satisfies environmental criteria because the number of devices in circulation can be reduced, the devices in circulation can be reused, and any old devices can be easily recycled, as you'll likely need to give back your old device to get a newer version. Hardware as a service also satisfies social criteria 
because everyone will have subscription services for the same devices. There will be no phone with a better camera or a bigger memory, nor a faster or slower or bigger or smaller car, and that means everyone will be truly equal. Hardware as a service satisfies governance criteria because it will put the company producing the product in total control of its creation, use, and destruction. Anyways, more about ESG in the description. Now, unlike most other ESG-related policies, hardware as a service could actually result in actual profits because people will be paying subscription services for just about everything they own until they die. Notably, the subscription costs could be made low enough so that these products are available to more people, not just the privileged few in developing countries where most of the demand for these products is currently coming from. Whereas planned obsolescence was introduced as a means of solving the Great Depression, it looks like hardware as a service is being introduced to prevent another depression from occurring by ensuring consumption continues to increase, even as the demographic decline continues. Now, don't get me wrong, hardware as a service is unlikely to be forced upon us consumers. As we've recently seen with other products, applying too much force tends to result in an equal or greater amount of pushback because, hey, people know something is up when they don't have a choice in the matter. Instead, the ability to own anything will likely become ever more difficult as time goes on, and I suspect they'll start with the things that tend to be the most expensive purchases for the average person. At the top of this list, we have housing, whose costs have been going through the roof in most countries. As I mentioned in our recent video about the housing market, the rising costs in this corner of the economy will eventually cause the population to push politicians to do something. As we've seen in countries like Germany, one of the outcomes could be that the government starts nationalising housing, i.e. taking it away from landlords in the name of the greater good, and while these policies will be directed towards the big fish at first, the small fish will come next, just like with taxation. Alternatively, if the housing market collapses, we could see asset managers like Blackstone swoop in and acquire as many properties as possible with the freshly printed money they received from their respective central banks. Basically, your rent from the government or from Wall Street. The next item on the list is automobiles of all kinds, and this is where lots of work is already being done by car sharing companies like car to share shared electric scooter companies like Lime, and shared bicycle companies like Mobike. You can bet your bottom dollar that these entities are extracting as much data as they can in preparation for hardware-as-a-service models for similar automobiles, and the fact that many of these companies continue to receive large investments despite being barely profitable is evidence to this effect. On that note, hardware-as-a-service in automobiles is likely part of why there's such a huge push for electric vehicles. That's because it's easy to break the rules of a sharing economy when the vehicle is powered by petrol and hardware, but it's much harder to break the rules when the vehicle is powered by electricity and software. Moreover, there's a limit to how many electric cars can be made because there doesn't seem to be enough lithium on the planet to replace existing cars with electric cars, according to the World Economic Forum's own research. This effectively guarantees that electric cars will need to be shared. Now, phones and computers will probably be the third class of products to get sucked into the hardware-as-a-service scheme, but I suspect it will take quite some time for the average person to be okay with this. That's because phones and computers are frequently listed as a person's most valuable possessions, primarily because it's something that you can truly shape according to your liking. These devices also contain lots of sensitive personal data that you'd rather keep to yourself and not share with anyone. Keeping track of phones and computers would also be very difficult without a digital ID, which is also a prerequisite for the rollout of central bank digital currencies and internet censorship, which the powers that be have explicitly stated they want to see. The worst part of all this is that there are increasing numbers of people who are unironically on board with this hardware-as-a-service idea. This is simply because an increasing number of people can't afford a home, a car, or even a nice computer or phone. I'll never forget the reaction I got when I told a few friends about how the World Economic Forum says you'll own nothing and be happy. They just sighed and said, well, I don't own anything anyway, so at least I'll be happy. If this is how you feel, take a second to consider that there is something very valuable that you own, and that is yourself. Then consider 
that some of the things that you do own are ultimately an extension of yourself. They allow you to be you. They allow you to exercise the ownership of yourself in the world. This is fundamentally why having a place to call home, having a way to move around, and having the ability to communicate and express yourself are objectively important and universally sought after. The fact that you don't have a home, a car, or even a nice computer or phone today doesn't mean that you won't have these things tomorrow. So long as the path to ownership of these and other things exists, you can find your way to them if you play your cards right, even if the system is rigged against you. Rest assured that you will never be happy in a world where the path to ownership to literally anything except your skin and bones has been blocked, because you will never be able to truly be yourself. Never mind that you might even lose the ownership of yourself because of a digital ID in such a world. So, what's the solution then? Well, by now it should be clear. The financial system we have now is not working, and some would say it hasn't been working for decades, if not longer, because it's not just hardware as a service. Planned obsolescence was proposed almost 100 years ago. As almost all of you will know, cryptocurrency was built to replace this broken financial system. And though cryptocurrency still has a very long way to go, it has already fixed one of the most important parts of finance, and that's the ability to truly own your assets. Now, you might think this is nothing new, but it really is. The money in your bank can be seized, and any physical property you have can be confiscated. Even your house can be taken from you if you don't pay your taxes, and in some countries, the government can take your property at will using eminent domain. I'm not kidding. Look it up. Now, you might think that this is fine, but it's really not. These are the sorts of legal levers that governments and corporations are slowly starting to pull to take control of everything you own. Once you realize this, it makes it easy to understand why MicroStrategy CEO Michael Saylor is so obsessed with Bitcoin. BTC can't be seized because it's not technically owned by a third party. It can't be confiscated because it's not physical, and it can't be taken by the government through some obscure law because the only law in crypto is immutable computer code. The harsh reality is that almost every other cryptocurrency does not come with these same ownership guarantees, be it due to their centralization or consensus mechanisms. This makes BTC the best hedge against a world where you will own nothing because it guarantees that you will own something. When you look around and realize that everyone owns nothing even now, there's lots to be happy about when you've got some sats to your name. Just make sure that you're holding those sats in your own personal crypto wallet, or else everything I just said about BTC will be irrelevant. You can find out about the best crypto wallets using the link in the description, and I would consider memorizing your seed phrase once you make one. It could save you someday. That's all for today's video about why you'll own BTC and be happy. If you felt it was important, consider taking a second to share it and be sure to smash that like button to let the algorithm know. If you want to make sure you don't miss the next video, subscribe to the channel and ping that notification bell down below. While you wait, here's where you can go. Coin Bureau clips for live streams and behind the scenes. The Coin Bureau podcast for crypto discussions that are occasionally obscene. Twitter, TikTok, and Instagram to follow me, and Telegram for all the daily crypto updates you need. Subscribe to my newsletter to find out which cryptos I hold, and support the channel by getting something from the Coin Bureau merch store. The description is where you can find the links to these resources and more. Thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you next time. Satoshi be with you, and all will be fine. Thank <laughs> you.